evening. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Ezekiel chapter 30. Ezekiel chapter 30, as we continue our study through Ezekiel. Even though this is a prophet, you'll notice that as we've been studying through, much of this, if not all of it, except for the coming of Christ in the first century, is really reading history. And so it helps us as we study through here to go ahead and take a look at what they call secular history, which we know there isn't really any secular. History is God's story. It's how he's determined all things. But as we study through these books, we see how the Lord prophesied concerning the rise and fall of nations that have long ago come and gone. And one of these that we're reading about here in Ezekiel 30, remember Ezekiel's in exile. Nebuchadnezzar had already come and taken two invasions, taken out people from the land, and what remained was the destruction of Jerusalem and the city. And Ezekiel would have lived through that time, although he was in exile already in Babylon. The Lord preserved him there. Jeremiah was still in the land when the Chaldeans came and invaded. And he witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and was even taken captive into Egypt. And so for many back in this day, they were still looking to Egypt as a possible nation that would provide protection against Nebuchadnezzar. And the Lord warned them not to go down into Egypt. Why? Because God had already purposed that Nebuchadnezzar would go down into Egypt and literally devastate Egypt. So all of this you can go back in your history books and read about in great detail, but what I find Wonderful is here we hold in our book a summary, a survey, exactly of what God said would take place and then what exactly took place as he said it. So here in Ezekiel chapter 30, beginning with verses 1 through 4, we see here described the day of the Lord against Egypt. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Howl ye, woe worth the day. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day, and it shall be the time of the heathen. In other words, the Gentiles coming in and ruling and, and conquering. And the sword shall come upon Egypt, and great pain shall be in Ethiopia, when the slain shall fall in Egypt, and they shall take away her multitude, and her foundations shall be broken down. So we know that both Egypt and Ethiopia, African nations back in the day, were very powerful even though today we don't think much about either of them. And there's still a lot of warfare going on over there, but it doesn't affect world events as much as what you hear about Russia and China and all these other nations. But every nation has had its day, even the United States. It's not forever. And here particularly, when it says... Here, woe worth the day, the way that's translated, another way of reading that is woe to the day. Here God had told Ezekiel to prophesy a woe to the coming day of the Lord against Egypt. A lot of people, when they see that day of the Lord, they think, okay, that's still future. No, this was the day of the Lord in Ezekiel's day pertaining to Egypt. There would be a day of God's intervention and vindication against Egypt. Here it's called a day of clouds against them. So in the context here, that's quite a statement. Imagine an exile 
from Judah, which is what Ezekiel was, already removed from the land. And yet he's declaring here that the Lord would bring an end to Egypt. Most people hearing that would think, well, who are you to make such a declaration? I know there are a lot of people today, preachers particularly, that are saying, thus saith the Lord God. But they're lying on God. Here, when the Lord says in verse 1, came again unto me, saying, I weigh this even as a preacher, that I would never open my mouth to say, thus saith the Lord God, but what he has declared it. Well, how do we know what he's declared? Sticking to the word. Not to speculation or to prophecy mongering, like you see so many doing with the scriptures, resting the scriptures to their own destruction. So Ezekiel here spoke these words. Think about it. At the time he spoke this, Egypt as a nation would have existed already for two and a half millennia. We're celebrating 250 some years here in the United States and woohoo! And already we're seeing the cracks in the foundation. They've been there for a good while. Who knows how much longer. But here was a nation that had existed for two and a half millennia. You think about the pyramids. You think about the symbols of achievement. At the, in the day of a great civilization. I read a book one time that talked about most of our modern luxuries that we enjoy today. Even plumbing and air conditioning were invented back in Egypt back in the day. That's the nation that Moses grew up under and had that education. And yet it says that he counted the suffering for Christ's sake worth more than everything that he'd ever had there in that, that nation. But here it describes the day of the Lord. From time to time, <clears throat> as you're reading history, and we've been looking at this for some time, even through Daniel, the visions that he had of the Lord raising up Babylon, and then putting them down, raising up Persia, putting them down, raising up Greece, putting them down, raising up Rome, putting them down. The only kingdom that God has brought in this world and established that is forever is the kingdom of his son. And that he did in the first century. And it is continuing today. Men don't see it, but the Lord came and redeemed a people, sinners from every tribe, nation, and tongue justified them through the shed blood of his son unto death and now he's calling out this is a worldwide kingdom calling out a people for his name and that is forever but all the rest of this has an end and that's what it means here the day of the lord when a nation reaches a climax of oppression and moral decay everything we're reading here from which god then brings a humbling and a destruction, the day of the Lord with regard to Egypt here was a day of reckoning. That's another way of putting that. And a day of clouds is what it says there. When you think about a day of clouds, Ezekiel probably had in mind God's judgment, perhaps coming as a powerful storm upon Egypt, complete with dark and ominous clouds. You think about how the Lord led the children of Israel out of Egypt with a bright cloud. And uh, yet the very Egyptians that had at one time enslaved Israel during all those years, now itself would be under a dark cloud. And how would that cloud come? Well, here it says the sword. See that in verse 4? The sword shall come upon Egypt. This would be a judgment that would come against Egypt and also it mentions Ethiopia, two nations up there in the northeastern part of the continent of Africa. And that this sword that should come against them would be none other than Nebuchadnezzar. After he had finished taking the land of Israel, he continued on down into Egypt and you can read about some of the great battles that took place between Egypt and uh, 
Babylon at that time. And Egypt thought to be able to conquer Babylon, but not to be because the Lord had already purposed the destruction of Egypt. There would be many dead. That's what it talks about. The, the slain shall fall in Egypt. And the army would be completely plundered. They would take away her wealth. When it says she shall take away her multitude and her foundation shall be broken down. So a very somber judgment that Ezekiel had to pronounce. And it shows he was God's prophet, not just for Israel, but for the then existing nations of the world. And I would say the same thing today. I may stand here preaching for you in Shreveport, Louisiana, but there is a message for the world that goes out into the world, one of salvation to those that God has chosen and Christ has redeemed and God has justified through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those he's going to call, draw to Christ through the simple message of the gospel, but there's also a message of condemnation to all others that God has purposed to judge. Verses 5 through 9, then, we, we read even the extent of these judgments, not just on Egypt, but upon the regions and peoples around Egypt. Notice here Ethiopia and Libya and Lydia and all the mingled people and Chub and the men of the land that is in league See, they all came together when they saw the ominous cloud of Nebuchadnezzar coming down into their land. He, he traveled over 1,500 miles to get down into that part of the world with his army. And so they were in league against him. But it says here, shall fall with them by the sword. Thus saith the Lord, they also that uphold Egypt shall fall. And the pride of her power shall come down from the tower of Syrene, Cyrene, shall they fall in it by the sword, saith the Lord God. The God's sovereign. He can use a sword, which is war. He can use famine. He can use disease. He can use climactic earthquakes and other things. All of these are at his disposition because he's God. Here's the sword. They shall be desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate, and her cities shall be in the midst of the cities that are wasted. Again, think of a great nation that Egypt was, but now brought to nothing by war. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I have set a fire in Egypt. Another way of describing his judgment. And when all her helpers shall be destroyed. In that day... Shall messengers go forth from me in ships to make the careless Ethiopians afraid? And great pain shall come upon them as in the day of Egypt, for lo, it cometh. Notice who sends the messengers to go forth in ships? He says, go forth from me. We're talking about warships, which back in the day... Nebuchadnezzar had developed and some of these other nations going to, to war would be likened to a royal navy. But who sends them? It's the Lord. And sends them against a people that were, here he says, a mingled people. A mixed people. Oftentimes during war, there are mercenaries that a nation will go out and hire to come help fight their battle for them. And Apparently, that's what Egypt did. They sent out and called for help for mercenaries. These are hired soldiers. We have them today in warfare. That's their career. That's their lifestyle. They go in and fight for, for money. And uh, that's this mixed or mingled people that the Lord mentions here, saying that even if they went out and brought all these in, it wasn't going to stop what God had purpose to do and you can go back and read in history books again that confirm the fact that Egypt made great use of hired soldiers from various nationalities and yet none of this could help them during this time you talk about I know the scriptures say if God be for us who can be against us but 
the opposite is also true. The, 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 uh, if God be against you, who could stand? So here in verses 10 to 12, again, we see how it describes Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of Egypt. See, when you have the key here and understand the flow, all of a sudden now it just kind of opens up and you begin to see, ah, he's talking about history. And what is it they say about history? If you don't learn from it, it's bound to repeat itself. Well, we've got a lot of learning to do just reading the prophet Ezekiel from the standpoint of history and God's sovereignty in it. They've taken the Bible out of our schools when in reality there's no greater history book than this Bible right here back way back in the day. That's what they used to teach children straight from the Bible. And uh, yet today it's been renounced. But that doesn't change God's direction and what God determines to do. Here in verse 10, thus saith the Lord God, I will also make the multitude of Egypt to cease by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. See, it's pretty clear, isn't it? He and his people with him, the terrible of, all, of the nation, shall be brought to destroy the land, and they shall draw their swords against Egypt and fill the land with the slain. Who is it that kills? It's God. Who is it that makes alive? It's God. He determines both. And it says here, I will make the rivers dry. This is God speaking. And sell the land into the hand of the wicked, and I will make the land waste and all that is therein. By the hand of strangers, I, the Lord, have spoken it. I remember years ago when Katrina came through and they started interviewing some of these religious people down there in New Orleans and asking them, well, who did this? Did God do this? And I remember a preacher on national TV saying, no, God wouldn't do this. He's too loving to do this. Well, they don't know God. Everything that takes place is from the hand of God. When he says, I'll make the rivers dry and sell the land in the hand of the wicked, God promised to bring widespread destruction upon Egypt so great that even the water from the life-giving Nile to the associated rivers would seem to fail them. And God would make the land waste. Why? Because he's God. And so verses 13 to 19, the judgment on the regions and cities of Egypt. It says, thus saith the Lord God, I will also destroy the idols. Here we go again. What is the object of God's wrath? Idolatry. Someone was asking, well, what is idolatry? Well, it begins with the word I. So anything that is pertaining to me, my, and I, and not to the glory of God, is idolatry. And so he says, I will cause their images to cease out of Noph, and there shall be no more a prince in the land of Egypt, and I will put a fear in the land of Egypt, and I will make Pathros desolate. These were all big cities back in the day. And will set fire in the Zoan and will execute judgments in No. And I will pour my fury upon Sin, the strength of Egypt, and I will cut off the multitude of No. Sometime, if you take the time to get a Bible encyclopedia and just look up these different cities that existed back in the day, you'll see they were prosperous cities. Every bit as much as what we have in our country today. The Los Angeles, the Chicago, the New York. These were all mighty cities back in the day. And the Lord brought them to naught. And I will set fire in Egypt. Sin shall have great pain. And no shall be rent asunder. And Noph shall have distresses daily. The young men of Avon and of Pibeseth shall fall by the sword, and these cities shall go into captivity. And uh, to Hophanes also, the day shall be darkened when I shall break there the yokes of Egypt, and the pomp of her strength shall cease in her. As for her, a cloud shall cover her. There it is again. We're talking about a dark cloud of judgment over the entire land, and her daughters shall go into captivity. Thus, I execute judgments in Egypt and they shall know that I am the Lord 
It's pretty much the same language as was used when the Lord first delivered Israel out of Egypt, that they might know that I am the Lord. His judgments were brought against. These were idolatrous cities. These were ones that they trusted in and looked to, just like when the Lord brought those plagues in Egypt. Those were against every one of the gods that they worshipped, the little G-O-D-S's. And the Lord promises here to destroy these idols, idolatrous cities, and put fear in the land of Egypt. We live in a day where people wear that on their shirts, you know, no fear. But uh, little do they know the power of God and his justice when he talks about making Pathros desolate, setting fire to Zoan. Beginning with Noth, here the Lord listed all these Egyptian cities and not only listed them, but the specific judgments that he would bring and how he would bring them down. When it talks about fire, I'm talking about these cities being burnt to the ground. When it speaks of her daughters, that's metaphorically speaking. It's talking about the towns and villages all about Egypt. Literally her children. And they shall know that I am the Lord. The Lord in judgment. So much for those that preach God is love and has a wonderful plan for your life. There are those that God has loved in his son and would send his son to pay their sin debt, but God doesn't owe salvation to any. And uh, for the most part, we see where the vessels of wrath far outnumber the vessels of mercy. That's the way God's purposed it. Here in verses 20 and 21, it talks about God breaking Pharaoh's arms. It's very interesting language. It came to pass in the eleventh month, eleventh year of the, in the first month, in the seventh day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, "Son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and lo, it shall not be bound up to be healed, to put a roller to bind it, to make it strong, to hold the sword." The eleventh year in the first month. This was another of. Ezekiel's prophecies with a specific date and this this would be the fourth prophecy in this book against Egypt that was given about four months before the fall of Jerusalem so if that helps you see how close this was all this to take place at that time as we saw many were still looking to Egypt to hope and find help with her we saw that in Jeremiah 37 but the Lord said don't you dare go down there because I've broken the arm of Pharaoh it's spoken as if it was already done, but that's the way they write it in the Hebrew. If something's certain, they put it as if it's already accomplished. But it was yet to be accomplished. This was to be an act of judgment, a demonstration of God's power and strength. Metaphorically breaking the arm of Pharaoh. And even if he had it bandaged for healing, that it would not be strong enough even to hold a sword. In other words, God purposed that Pharaoh would be left defenseless. And so, verses 22 and 23, he talks about breaking one arm. Here, he talks about breaking both arms. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and will break his arms, the strong and that which was broken and I will cause the sword to fall out of his hand and I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and will disperse them through the countries and I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon and put my sword in his hand but I will break Pharaoh's arms and he shall groan before him with the groanings of a deadly wounded man such as the judgment of the Lord when he's purposed. Doesn't matter how mighty a king is, if the Lord's purpose to bring him down, he'll bring him down. But I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon. The arms of Pharaoh shall fall down, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon. And he shall stretch it out upon the land of Egypt. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them among the countries and they shall know that I am the Lord. I believe there are still 
people from Egypt way back in this day that have been scattered throughout the world, if you trace their history all the way back, it'd be back in this time when they're displaced. So this prediction of scattering into exile is repeated once more. But who did it? God did it. People like to put that on their license plate if they got a fancy car or something. They feel blessed. God did it. But how many think of this in terms of God's judgment and holiness where he reveals himself that they might know that I am the Lord. Gracious Father, thank you for this word. May we learn from history not to put any confidence in this flesh or in the strength of any nation, particularly our own, but to wait upon you and to look to you alone, even in a day where so many are looking to the arm of their flesh, and yet we read here where it takes nothing for you just to break the arms and remove the sword and make a people defenseless. Oh, that we might thank you for that great salvation that you worked out in disarming Satan himself and this flesh through the death of Christ. Remove the sword so that we would not experience that judgment that would be our due. But the Lord Jesus Christ himself took the judgment and bore the sword of your justice that sinners such as we are might be justified through his finished work. Pray that you would continue to bless our time of worship together and make us mindful of our need of you at all times. I give you the praise and honor and glory in Christ's precious name. Amen.